Okay, let's unpack this. You're uh, thinking about your gut health, right? Maybe you've started taking lactobacillus reiterate, perhaps using a specific product. Mm -hmm. And you're adding inulin because, well, everyone says it's a good prebiotic. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to feed the good bugs. Yeah, that's the common wisdom, definitely. But what if, and this is what we're digging into today, what if inulin isn't actually the best food for the specific readery strain you're using. Exactly. What if you could get, you know, even better results by choosing a different food source? Right. So this deep dive reveals that um, common wisdom might be a bit off here. Inulin might not be the superstar for all L readery strains. And we've actually got some science to back that up. We're looking yeah. at potentially better options like GOS and even the role of protein and uh, glycerin. No, precisely. So... For this deep dive, we've looked closely at a couple of really um, insightful studies. Mm -hmm. One analyzed how readery LRO8. You find that in a specific product, how it grows on different carbohydrates. Mm. And the other one, it focused on the preferred foods for those, you know, really well-known Biogaia readery strains. That's DSM 169A3 Protectus and ATCC 6475 Osfortis. Ah, yes. Those are very popular strains. So our mission here is basically to move beyond the sort of general prebiotic advice and find out what really works best for you to nourish these specific reader restraints. Actionable insights, that's the goal. Absolutely. And what's great is that these studies give us a really detailed picture, you know, strain by strain. So let's start with inulin's performance, specifically with that rudery LR08. What did that first study find? Well, okay, get ready for a bit of a surprise here. This study compared inulin and FOS which is basically just broken down inulin against other carbs, even just plain glucose. And the results. The results. Inulin and FOS performed no better than glucose in terms of growth rate, I mean. Really? No better than simple sugar? Yeah. We're talking growth rates around uh, 0.2 to 0.3 for inulin, maybe mm -hmm. 0.34 to 0.43 for FOS, while glucose was like 0.42. So it really challenges that idea that inulin is automatically the best prebiotic choice, doesn't it? It certainly does. It really underscores that prebiotics aren't like a one-size-fits-all solution for beneficial bacteria. Was there anything else that stood out in that LRO8 study? Oh, absolutely. What really jumped out was how much better other prebiotics did for this LRO8 strain. Yeah. GOS, that's galactoligosaccharides, showed growth rates between 0.73 and 0.95. Okay, that's significantly higher. Way higher. And resistant dextrin was right up there too, 0.67 to 0.95. That's like two to three times the growth rate compared to inulin. Two to three times. That's substantial. It really is. Even plain glucose did a bit better than inulin for this strain. So for you listening, if you're using a product with LRO8 and just adding inulin, well, this suggests there might be more effective ways. Definitely something to consider. It really highlights the strain specificity we were talking about. What works wonders for one might do very little for another. Okay, so let's shift gears to the second study, the one looking at the BioGaia strains. Let's start with Protectus, DSM-11983. What did they find it likes to eat? Right, Protectus, well, it had a clear number one favorite, sucrose. Sucrose, just regular table sugar? Yep, plain old sugar. After that, its preference went to lactose, then lactulose, then GOS. Good to see GOS showing up again. And then glucose was further down the list. Interesting hierarchy. So sugar first, but what about inulin or FOS? Where did that land for Protectus? Get this, arabinogalactin and FOS, the inulin type, provided zero support, none whatsoever. Zero growth. Zero growth for the Protectus strain on FOS inulin. Wow. Okay, that's pretty definitive then. Inulin is not the food for Protectus. What about the other BioGaia strain, Osfortis, ATCC 6475? For Osfortis, the story was a bit different, but still no love for inulin. Its top food was actually glucose. Followed by GOS, there it is again, then lactose, and then sugar. So sugar was lower down for Osfortis compared to Protectus. And the ones it didn't like? Similar story to Protectus, actually. Osfortis did not grow on lactulose, FOS, so inulin again, or arabidoglactin. So across all three of these strains, LRO8, Protectus, Osfortis, we're seeing a pattern, aren't we? Inulin isn't really living up to its general reputation. Not for these specific strains, no. But it's really worth highlighting how GOS performed pretty well you know, consistently across both studies for all three strains. Yes, exactly. Based on this evidence, GOS looks like a um, generally reliable choice if you're dealing with any of these three reader eye. And those findings on resistant dextrin with LRO8 were also quite strong, weren't they? Especially given its high resistant starch content. Right, yeah. It makes you think, even if a strain like Protectus can grow on sucrose, maybe there are still reasons to prefer something like GOS or resistant dextrin instead. 
That's a really good point. And the studies do suggest a potential advantage there. Prebiotics like GOS and resistant dextrin might actually help inhibit the growth of um, less desirable or even pathogenic bacteria. Ah, okay. That makes sense. And that's especially important if you're doing home ferments, right? You want to give your target reader in the edge and keep contaminants down. That's a huge factor for home fermenters, definitely. Safety and getting the right bacteria to dominate. Did the sources give any hints on like how much prebiotic to use in a home ferment? Yeah, they did offer a starting point, suggesting around 10 to 20 grams per liter seems like a reasonable range to begin experimenting with for home ferment. Okay, 10 to 20 grams per liter, good guideline. Now you mentioned resistant starch with the resistant dextrin. What about other resistant starches like um, potato starch, or green banana flower, arrowroot, are they likely good options too? Well, they weren't directly tested on the BioGaia strains in that second study, but based on the LRO8 results with resistant dextrin, it's, you know, plausible they could be effective too. They do contain resistant starch. But there's a catch, right? Especially for home fermenting. Yes, there's a practical hurdle. For safety, you typically need to pasteurize your base, especially if it's milk. But the heat from pasteurization unfortunately breaks down a lot of that resistant starch. Ah, uh, so it kind of defeats the purpose of adding it in the first place. Exactly. And the source materials strongly advise against skipping pasteurization because the risk of contamination just goes way up. You don't want to be growing the wrong things. Right, okay. So using things like raw potato starch in your ferment is probably not the best idea from a safety perspective, even if it might feed the reedery. Makes sense. Okay, so we've talked a lot about carbs, but the research highlights another key factor, doesn't it? Bioavailable protein. Yes, that's a crucial piece often overlooked. It turns out readery isn't great at breaking down complex proteins on its own, especially milk proteins like casein. So it needs a little help? It seems so. The studies found that adding pre-digested protein things like whey hydrolysate or even other hydrolyzed sources like collagen peptides or maybe some plant-based ones can significantly boost readery growth. That's really interesting. So if mm -hmm. you're trying to ferment readery in milk, which is obviously protein rich, the readery might still struggle because it can't easily access that protein. Precisely. And the studies actually show that readery tends to grow least effectively in plain milk compared to other bases like soy milk, oat milk, coconut milk, or even juice ferments. Wow. So adding that readily available sort of pre-digested protein can make a big difference, especially if you're set on using a milk base. Good to know. Okay, so optimal carbs like GOS or resistant dextrin, plus potentially adding some hydrolyzed protein. Mm. What else the sources mentioned? Glycerin too. Right, glycerin, adding just a small amount, like uh, two thirds to one teaspoon per liter can give readery another boost. How does that work? Well, it seems glycerin helps the readery utilize the carbohydrates more efficiently for energy production making ATP. So better fuel efficiency means more growth. Like optimizing the engine. Mm. Okay. And glycerin has another trick up its sleeve, doesn't it? Something antimicrobial. Yes, exactly. When readery metabolizes glycerin, it produces something called reiterin. And reiterin is a potent antimicrobial compound. Ah, so it helps fight off the unwanted bacteria we were talking about earlier. Correct. It adds another layer of defense against contaminants, helping the readery establish dominance. So glycerin is kind of a double win boosts readery growth, and helps suppress competitors. That sounds like a pretty useful addition for home fermenters trying to get a clean readery culture. Okay. Uh, one more thing the source has touched on. Sometimes home fermenters notice the pH drops really slowly, mm. slower than they expect, maybe compared to making regular yogurt. Why might that happen? Yeah, that's a common observation and often a source of confusion. The reason is often that in many home ferments, especially milk-based ones, the really rapid drop in pH isn't primarily caused by the readery. It's caused by other bacteria. Often, yes. It's caused by wild or contaminant bacteria that are naturally present, like Streptococcus thermophilus. That's a bug used in commercial yogurt because it's so fast at producing acid. So if your ferment gets sour really quickly, it might actually mean these other bacteria are doing most of the work, not necessarily your readery. That's often the case. DNA testing on some home ferments has actually shown these other bacteria can make up a huge chunk of the population, like 60%, sometimes even up to 90%. And sometimes, unfortunately, those can include potentially pathogenic strains too. Whoa, 60 to 90 percent. That's a lot. So flipping that around, if you are successfully feeding your readery a well, maybe using GOS and glycerin and inhibiting contaminants, 
a slower pH drop might actually be expected. Exactly. It could even be a sign that you're succeeding. Readery is naturally a slower grower and therefore a slower acidifier compared to something like S. thermophilus. Right. So if you're using strategies to specifically boost readery and keep others down, it's perfectly normal, even desirable, for the fermentation to take longer to reach that target pH, maybe around 4.5. Hmm. It's not necessarily a problem. Okay, that's a really important clarification for people doing this at home. Don't panic if it takes longer. It might mean the readery is actually thriving. So let's try and summarize the key takeaways here for everyone listening. Sounds good. The big one seems to be, if you're focusing on lactobacillus readery, especially strains like LRO8, Biogaia protectus, or Osfortis, you really should question if inulin is the best prebiotic choice for you. That's the core message, definitely. The evidence we looked at strongly suggests it's often not the optimal food for these particular strains, despite its general reputation. And instead, you might want to look much more closely at options like GOS. That seems to be a pretty consistently good performer across the board for these strains. Yep, GOS looks promising. And resistant dextrin also showed significant potential, at least for the LRO8 strain tested. And remember, it's not just about the carbs. Think about adding bioavailable uh, hydrolyzed protein especially if you're fermenting in milk. Right. That can make a real difference to growth. And don't forget about adding a little bit of glycerin, maybe 23 to 1 TSP per liter, to potentially boost growth and help inhibit unwanted microbes via reuterine production. So armed with these you know, more specific insights into what these lactobacillus reutery strains actually prefer to eat, it really makes you wonder, doesn't it? How might you listening now rethink your own approach to supporting reutery growth? Mm. And maybe think about what other sort of overlooked factors might be subtly influencing the health and balance of that incredibly complex world inside our gut. Definitely some food for thought there.